Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me tonight. I have a very special guest in the house. We have Martha from Vintage Conversation, and we are here for a show and tell. I'm just really loving these, and it's so fun to have a variety of guests and collections on. So tonight, Martha will be showing her vintage pattern collection. So Martha, introduce yourself. Well, hi, everybody. I am Martha with Vintage Conversation. I am on all platforms under Vintage Conversation. I have an eBay store and I do YouTube videos covering hauls and estate sales and travels that I make with my husband. And I do live sales. And most of that occurs every Tuesday at 3 Central, 4 Eastern. Well, Martha has a fantastic channel and she really does some uh, great live sales. So definitely go check her out. I've linked her channel below, but of course, any of my moderators can throw her link in during this live. That would be wonderful. Martha really does have a great channel. So go subscribe and make sure you thumbs up this video. That really does help a lot. Lots of great folks in the chat tonight. I see Venny is joining us. Hello, Vintage Venny. Welcome, welcome. And Mel is coming in all the way from Finland. I love that we have people from all around the world. And Diane Broderick is here. And Kathy, First Stop Shop. And Karen Radford. And Kim at Oh My Vintage. Debbie, our Vagabond Travels, is joining us. Chad, Shop Retro Days. Angela Marksberry is here. Simon, Sabrina Simon is here. Jay Goodwin. There is just tons of folks joining us tonight. I see Tammy Renee is back. Hello, Tammy. Welcome. Oh, and of course, the chat just jumped like it always does. <laughs> I see Jeannie, Chicago lady, coming in, and Helen Casey and Christina Gallinowski. Welcome, folks. Lena McCord is here. Vintage Love and Nerd is from Canada. So we've got Finland and Canada represented. And Jenna, Vintage Diggs, a resident strawberry lovers in the house, Laura Melendez. Hello, <laughs> Laura. <laughs> and Dean Oliver is here. Oh, and the chat jumped again. Man, StreamYard can be tricky. Angela, put your link in. So thanks, Angela. You're quick with that. Maria is joining us. Empty Nesting 2. Susan Funderberg is here. Hello, hello. And Martha from San Francisco. Awesome. That's wonderful. We have uh, Lori Blue Flamingo, another fellow Floridian. And uh, Marianne from All in the Attic Treasures. And Carrie is here. So we got uh, Texas represented for you, Martha. That's exciting. And Sheila Putman's coming in. Hello, Sheila. And uh, Vintage Uprising Texas, Tammy. So awesome, guys. Thanks so much. This is wonderful to have all of you here tonight. Now, uh, Martha, where are you from? I think I just touched on that, but I'll, I'll let you go ahead and answer that. I am in a little town outside of Houston in Texas. It's called Channel View. It's a little bitty thing, <laughs> but it is not an actual city. It's just an unincorporated area. Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful. A few more hellos here. I see uh, Daniel joining us from Tacky is Me. Hi, Daniel. And uh, Calypso Cat. So wonderful. Thanks, guys. Oh, and Auntie K snuck in there. The chat always moves so fast in StreamYard. So thank you guys for coming. And Rita. I can't forget Rita here. <laughs> so guys, make sure that you subscribe to Martha, a vintage conversation. The link is in the chat and of course down below in the description box. And at any point during this show, if you have a question for Martha, please let us know and I'll highlight it. You can ask any question and I will throw it up on the screen, whether that's about patterns or you just want to know a little bit more about Martha. So Martha, what got you started in collecting vintage patterns? I'm really curious because this is such a neat collection. Well, my mother, who could actually make her own patterns, sewed a lot of our clothes and her own clothes. So from the earliest age, I remember seeing patterns around the house. And I started out making Barbie clothes probably around the age of eight. So we started sewing early in our house. And... Um, 
I don't know. I just, I like the way they look. They're, they're almost a paper doll, but something you can make for yourself. And you just get to look at so many different time periods and I'm drawn to, you know, earlier time period clothing more than I am to now. So I started going to the Goodwill bins and Goodwill and stuff, and they were there and they were plentiful. And I had some from where I made stuff for my kids. And so I just started picking them up. I can't stand to see them staying there, you know? So that's basically it. And now I got a bunch of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I love um, that handmade clothing that parents or grandparents would make. My great grandmother made a lot of clothes out of uh, flower sacks for my grandmother because they had such pretty designs. So I always mm -hmm. think that's a really special connection like you have to your family there. Now, are most of the patterns out in the wild you're finding at Goodwills or do you also find them at antique stores? Well, most of the patterns I get have come from the Goodwill bins. They're just filled in the bins and, you know, they're cents on the, on the pound. So I pick them up there. I will buy them at Goodwill if there's something I like and they're reasonably priced. And I also buy them at antique stores. Almost all antique malls will have some they're not always what I want. I mean, I'll take all of them at the bins just to rescue them. But if I'm going to Goodwill or an antique mall, then they have to be something that I like for me to spend more money on them. Gotcha. So what's the most you're willing to pay for a vintage pattern? Oh, uh, you know, I really can't answer that question because I've never really been faced with that situation. Usually I just go, eh, I like it, but I'm not paying $5. I'll pay three. But if it was something I really loved, I don't know. I've, I've just never had to cross that bridge, luckily. <laughs> well, Patrick's joining us tonight. Thank you, Patrick, trusty huckster mercantile. And Christina's saying that uh, she used to make all of her doll's clothes. So that's a, such a wonderful memory. And uh, Daniel's saying that he just got a bunch of vintage patterns. So that's oh. exciting, Daniel. Might have to reach out to Martha and see if she wants any to add to her collection. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> and Nettie's saying that she loves the graphics on the pattern envelopes. I remember looking through them at a fabric store for my mom to make for me. So that is wonderful. So uh, Patrick's asking a great question here. He's saying, is there a brand of pattern that is more desirable than other patterns? Well, the answer to that is sort of. <laughs> there are some patterns that can fetch a high dollar. You know, there are some, for instance, there are some Vogue patterns that are worth a lot of money. Most patterns, no. Most of them are $15 and less. But since I don't collect them to, you know, for their value monetarily, they're just aesthetic value to me, I really can't give you a 100% answer on that. Well, and I think a lot of us are probably coming from the collecting group of wanting to just have the cool graphics or have a memory from our, our childhood. And I think that's really neat too. But it's always good to look out for those vintage patterns. Uh, Jewel S is saying, do you use them to make clothes or just collect patterns? Well, I would say the majority of the patterns I have, they are just for the collection. But I have numerous of the pat of my patterns that I have actually used to make things from, especially the ones I started out with in the 80s when I was making clothes and costumes for my, for my kids. But now, as far as the really vintage ones goes, it's usually aprons. Those are the ones that I really pick up to actually use. I make vintage aprons. Oh, that is wonderful. Vintage aprons are so fun. They really are. So show us your uh, most expensive pattern that you've ever bought. Oh. And I know that's hard because you that say is that hard you find I, a lot of them. Yeah, I find them all over. I think... I think probably this one, and it, it was so expensive. I think I spent four or five dollars on it. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a 1968 um, Simplicity wedding ensemble. So with this one, you get two different styles of wedding dresses. They're basically the same style, but they have a different uh, fabric usage and some different uh, um, decorative items. But you get um, 
short, long, mother's dress, uh, bride's mother, mother-in-law, bridesmaids, the whole thing. And that I just, mm, I love this look. This look. The graphic is great. Is, I mean, unless you go to the, the 1950s where the dresses got really more intricate and, and you know, just, they, I just can't even talk when I look at it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so this was probably my most expensive at five dollars. And I think that's still a great bargain for those. Oh, it those is. <laughs> and uh, I see Christina saying the original printing simplicity patterns can get pretty pricey. Have you been seeing that, Martha? Or do you know? Um, all of these are originals. I don't pick up um, the the remakes, the reprints. Um, because they're, they're, they're just different, but they, that you, you can always tell that they're a reprint because they cost more <laughs> They will, and you'll see the price on it. You'll see the modern price on their reprinted, um, pattern. So I don't, I don't have any, any, so actually I would say reprinted ones are more expensive because of the price of patterns these days. And uh, I, I do think they're still making Simplicity. Is that right? Oh, yes. Simplicity, Butterick, Vogue, McCall's, um, many others. Yeah, that all have huge lines of patterns. Diane saying, sewing was my mother's life. She sewed every day and she made her daughter's wedding dress. So that's very special. And uh, Patrick has a great question here. Patrick is... Let's see. I just lost the comment. <laughs> I know he's saying, is there value in just the folder if the actual pattern is no longer inside? Well, the most valuable of the patterns will be an uncut that has never been used with the patterns inside. And then after that, you will have the cut patterns as long as they're complete. And then the incompletes and then the envelopes on their own. But there's more you can do with just the envelopes. So to me, they have a, a much higher usage factor. If I'm not going to make the dress, then I'll be happy with just the envelope. Now, how do you display these vintage patterns? Do you uh, frame them or do you keep them uh, in a nice box? Well, right now, they're in a pretty box, so I'm not hoarding. <laughs> That's right. Um, but when my studio gets finished, um, there are so many different things that you can do with these. You can frame them. You can mat and frame them. You can get like a, a four pane window, a vintage window. You can distress it and then you can put the, the envelopes behind the glass and it looks lovely. You can make paper dolls out of them. You can make, um, junk journals out of them. They make beautiful junk journals, especially when you add bits of material with them. Book uh, marks. I mean, there's just, there are so many things that you can do with these envelopes. And I'll give you a secret. This is, this was my big desire with these. You can get um, fabric transfers from Joann's and Amazon, that sort of thing. I would like to take some of these and turn them into quilt blocks and make a quilt with these pattern envelope covers featured in the quilt. That's that's oh goal. how marvelous. That just sounds so great. I mean, what a great way to honor those old patterns. So uh, I see that Tammy's saying simplicity are supposed to be the easier ones to use. Do you find that to be true? Well, they say they are, but they actually make one called sewing for dummies. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's that what I need. Mean. That are the easiest patterns to follow. But, you know, you can you can use it's more the style of what you're making than the maker of the pattern. If you buy a complicated pattern, it doesn't matter if it's simplicity or vogue, it's going to be more difficult. But if you buy a simple, basic pattern and you can look on the back of the patterns and you can see what the different pattern pieces are. You can see the layout. It tells you how much fabric you're going to need, what kind of notions you're going to need. You know, 
Did I have that upside down? No, oh, okay, right. The um, types of fabrics and everything. So you can look at it and you can kind of get an idea. Okay, there's, you know, there's 36 pieces in this pattern. Hmm, maybe I want to do the one that's only got four pieces to this pattern. That sounds like it might be a little bit easier. And you're going to find that with all the patterns. It's really more about the design, the, the item, than it is the pattern maker. Now, how many vintage patterns do you think you have, Martha? Well, I have two groups of patterns. I have a bunch of patterns that I put into storage before we started building this building. When I started doing eBay and I needed the room, that's where some of my oldest patterns are. But since that time, I have collected almost 100 additional patterns that I have sitting right here beside me. Oh, so wow. Probably, I probably have about between 150 and 175 vintage patterns. That is just amazing. Now, Marianne is asking uh, that she's seen many of those. And she says, how do you know if it has all the pieces inside? And that's a very good question, Marianne. Well, since generally I'm not buying them to make, I don't open it up and, and do all the, if they've been cut, you know, I don't go in there and count all the little ones. Um, but if you take them out, you can see if all the pieces are there of the uncut portions because most patterns will have uh, one, two, or three views. Like that, the wedding one I showed you had um, has several uh, different outfits, but they share pattern pieces. So it's not like I have to have individual pieces for each one of these dresses. The, the two wedding dresses are going to share a bunch of pieces, and then the short dresses are going to share pieces. And the long dress is going to share pieces with the long wedding dresses, but a different sleeve that's going to come from the short. So you can take them out. You can look. There is a guide inside, an instruction guide. Let's see if I can pull you one out here. And on the instruction guide, it shows you every piece of, I'm trying to find a different one. It shows you every piece of pattern that is supposed to be in that pattern. Here we go. All right. Okay. You get an instruction guide. And as you can see right there in the center, it shows you every piece that's supposed to be in there and how many of those views. And so you just, you just look. Some of these are uncut. Let's see here. And so you can look at them, and some of them are cut, and you just got to lay them out and start counting them. <laughs> it can be a mess. So it, it's really going to be determined by what you plan to do with the pattern itself. That is wonderful. And I, I think those instruction booklets are kind of neat, too, because they've got some great graphics on them as well. Exactly. The, the decoupage possibilities of the, the tissue pattern um, patterns themselves, because most patterns are made of a thin tissue paper. So they, they work very well for decoupaging different items. Um, I have one here I'll show you in a minute that has a different type of pattern material in it. And I find, though, that as years go by, the older the pattern and the more it's been used, the more fragile the tissue paper comes. So I would suggest if you buy a pattern specifically to make things from it, you may have to get um, a pattern paper from Joann's or like a packing paper. You may have to trace and duplicate your pattern so you have something a little bit more durable to pin down to your materials and cut out, especially if it's something like an apron or whatever that you're going to make multiples of the same pattern. That's a really good tip. My best friend that did my logo, Frank, he does costume design and he gets old patterns all the time and duplicates them so that they're all new and fresh again. Mm-hmm. And Patrick has a great question here. He's saying for clothing patterns, are certain sizes more valuable? Um, honestly, I can't tell you the truth, but based on selling clothes on eBay, I would say that it would make sense that patterns that are a larger size would be more valuable because there would be less of them. The standard size for people 
back in the 50s and the 60s were smaller than what we are today. So there aren't as many, they didn't make as many larger size patterns. So it would stand to reason that a larger size pattern would have more value than, you know, the mass marketed size six, size eight. That makes so much sense because a lot of those vintage clothes you don't see in larger sizes either. Exactly. I see Patrick. He's got all the great questions for us tonight. Patrick's asking, do you collect any of the patterns that were published in magazines or just the ones in envelopes? Well, thank you for asking. Um, the ones in envelopes are the ones that you would go to the fabric store and purchase. You'd look at the big catalog, look in the different sections and decide what you, you know, what you wanted to make evening gown, pajamas, baby clothes, whatever, and you'd get that pattern. But magazines and newspapers also advertised patterns in their different um, sections. I can't recall what section it was in. Patrick probably knows. But you would fill out a little form and send them their money, usually cash in your envelope, and they would mail you a pattern. These were called... Um, uh, Oh my gosh, I've lost it. Um, <laughs> you know, just mail patterns. Let's just call it that because I can't remember the exact name of it right now. The, the mail, mail order, that's it, there we go. The mail order patterns. So you would send them your, your money and tell them which pattern on the little form that, that you were looking for and they'd send it to you. Now, this is misleading because this is just a standard envelope. The lady who purchased this one was smart enough to cut out the picture of the dress that she was wanting to make, the pattern she was purchasing. So when she got it, she attached it to her envelope. Oh, that's smart. And, you know, that's these started in like the 1930s. They were very popular in the 30s and 40s to have the, the mail order ones. But this one is was done in 1981. So they kept going for quite a while, probably in a sewing-specific magazine, I would I would imagine. Those graphics, again, I, I just think the graphics are so amazing on I these know. old pieces. And it's cool that they have survived all these years because those pattern pieces are quite thin. Yes, and these envelopes become very brittle as time goes by, depending upon how they've been kept. You know, were they in climate controlled or were they in the garage or so, so what is the best not, way to uh, to protect those from age? Do you find obviously keeping I'm sure in a cool spot helps, but how else do you store them so that they stay protected? Well, I, I like to keep them in a, I'll give you an example. I tend to keep, keep them in boxes where they stand up like this. They're, they're a little rummaged through right now. <laughs> I keep them in boxes, um, anything that would fit pattern-wise, so that they stay standing up and they 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 hold against each other. I don't if they're not enough to fit snugly, then I will lay them down. Otherwise, I that's I store them the same way they were in the um, the file ca uh, cabinets at the stores, which is up and down like that. When they start getting really brittle i of course put them in a i just put them in a ziploc because you know i leave it unzipped so that you know the air can flow in and out of them but that way it keeps them all together and it keeps things from rubbing on them and catching the edges that's a great tip i would imagine those ziplocs are perfect for them uh, I see Rita's asking, uh, sizes have changed over the years. So when sewing a vintage pattern, is it hard to modify to current sizing? Well, most patterns that you buy now, and even when you bought them there, they had a little, um, would have a little leeway. Let's see if this one's got it. They'll say on the package and they'll tell you, what my mother used to say is, add an inch up or down <laughs> for your sizes. So most of them will come with um, uh, a little edging. This particular one I've got out here to show you is not one of them. They would come with more than one set of cutting lines and it would tell you, you know, for six, cut here, for eight, cut here, for 10, cut there. Now, that's one thing. 
But also, if you look on the back of a lot of them, they will give you, see, right up here on the top of this one. Right up here, it shows the sizes, bust size, waist size, hip size, for the different sizes that you can get in the patterns and or that are covered by that pattern. So you have to measure yourself. And yes, if you measure yourself, I think you get a very true, accurate uh, size that way. Uh, Mel has a great question. He's saying, how about vintage patterns? Do people collect them and are there any value? Um, I am not familiar with this brand of patterns because what I have collected so far have all been American brands. Um, but I would assume that they would have at least as much value, maybe more, because there's probably less of them than there would have been of the more mass marketed, you know, American patterns. But that makes a lot of sense. I'd look online and check. <laughs> and Daniel's asking, how do you find the dates on them? Well, several ways. Some of them are nice enough to actually date them. Um, some of them date them along the bottom edges where they have their copyrights and where they're made. Some of them will date them on the envelope um, flap. Some of them, you have to look at that guide that I showed you, and they will be on there generally on the last page. Some of them are not nice, and they don't date them at all. So <laughs> then you have to be a sleuth, and you have to look, okay, what year do these clothes look like to me, okay? Is that a specific, did I see, did I see um, somebody get married in a dress like that? Is that like Mia Farrow's dress that she got married to Frank Sinatra in, or you know, something like that. You have to do some sleuthing. And if it's a mail order one, then you are going to want to look at the postmark on it. Mine, there was no date on the postmark. So I just had to do, I looked, this lady was nice enough to put on here that she had ordered it on 11 So it can be, it can be work. <laughs> Well, you know, advertising tens are like that. There's no date on a lot of them. So you just sort of have to judge by the graphics. And sometimes you go down a rabbit hole looking for the company that no longer exists. So uh, doing that uh, sleuthing can be kind of fun, but also a little frustrating at times. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, when you got this brittle tissue and you're going, is it on this piece? Is it on this piece? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so can you show us your uh, most inexpensive pattern my most inexpensive pattern okay i got this one just a couple of weeks ago at the bands in oklahoma so wait let me let me weigh this so i can tell you exactly how much this cost me let's see this weighs one ounce and it would have fallen under the 79 cents a pound category so what is that 10 cents. That's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not good at math either. <laughs> this, so this would be my most inexpensive. And it is a 1957 um, little girl's pattern. Oh, I'm, I know with the, the ruffle petticoats and um, the little gloves. So yeah, this would be my most inexpensive pattern. Those are just darling little uh, images on there. I know, aren't they? And you know what? If you take the, the ruffle petticoat out from underneath them, you could still make them and, and for your little girls now. They'd just be little sundresses and pinafores and things like that. Oh, that's a great tip. Uh, let's see. Oh, I see Christina saying also the types of notions it's asking for can help you date it. Plastic zippers, 40s and 50s, for example. Yeah, very good. And Venny was mentioning also you can look at the hairstyles as a good indicator. Yeah. So what pattern do you have that has the most interesting story behind it? Maybe a, an interesting place you got it or? Well, they all came from the same places. So, I mean, the stories that go on at the bins, 
<laughs> we all know the bends are wild. <laughs> that's that's an episode of its own, I think. Um, but this particular pattern, like I said, I, I collect a lot of, of apron patterns, and this is from the late 40s, early 50s. It's an advanced pattern, and what I would say is interesting about it is one, the great condition that is in. It was obviously kept out of the sunlight and inside. It's not a reproduction. It is an original pattern. And I've made these. I've made um, the little half apron for myself. And I made the this one right here with the triangle bib for my daughters for Christmas two years ago. So to me, this is the most interesting one because of that. Because I've actually used them for my family as gifts. I think that adds to the story behind it and it just makes it more special. And I really like the hairstyle on those ladies on that one. Mm-hmm. They got the little the little roll. <laughs> so Christina's saying, have you ever elbowed someone for a good pack? Turn at the beds. Maybe you don't I, want to answer that. I will not answer on the grounds that I might incriminate myself. <laughs> so um, I'm going to let you just show some of your other patterns, Martha. And of course, guys, you can keep asking questions, all great questions here in the chat, but I want to see some eye candy. So take it away, Martha. All right. A, a lot of the patterns, what I have done is looked at them and decided, um, you know, when, when they would be used. So for instance, this pattern is from the 1960s. And so when I see this pattern, I think Laura Petrie from Dick Van Dyke. The same kind of outfits that she wore in the first season of Dick Van Dyke, which they made her practically quit wearing in the following seasons because they had so many people writing in and complaining about her not wearing dresses and wearing pants too often. So after the first season, you really didn't see her wearing outfits like this very much unless she was dancing in the living room. They were entertaining and stuff with, you know, those, the little, the community theater group that they had. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah. And then this one is 1965. And when I look at it, I see the subsequent seasons of Dick Van Dyke. When Laura would go out for lunch, she'd stop by the office where Rob was working to go for lunch, maybe coming home from shopping, um, going on a game show and telling people that Alan Brady was actually bald. Uh, they were three-piece <laughs> suits generally. They would have the, the skirt and the jacket, and you would wear a shell blouse underneath it. And also, if you watch the Lucy show, Lucille Ball's show after I Love Lucy, where she worked for Mr. Mooney, she wore a suit like this almost without fail every day that she went to work. So these mean a lot to me because I always thought when I was a little girl, I would grow up and get a job and dress just like that. Television really influenced me. <laughs> I love uh, that classic look that the women wore because it's just so classy and elegant, I think. I have a 1955 Vogue pattern. Oops. Look at that slim silhouette. Ooh, they're pretty. I know. Now, look, you're not crossing your legs in this dress. It's, it's just not happening. <laughs> All right. So I think this is where they decided that it was prim and proper for ladies to sit with their knees together because they had to be together and just hook your foot behind your ankle because, like I said, you can't cross nothing in there. Nope. Not in that long a dress. <laughs> have you ever seen Please Don't Eat the Daisies and Doris Day is trying to sit down in a dress like this on a couch? It's so hilarious. It's so, <laughs> it's so hard to do in a long ball gown. And I see uh, Daniel's asking, he says, I have a bunch of vintage hand-drawn patterns. I think they are from either plays or movies. Do you think there would be any value in them? Well, Daniel, you know, I really can't say because I don't collect that specific types of patterns. But what I would say is a lot of your value is going to depend on what play they're from. If they were from a very well-known um, Broadway play, say off the top of my head, Camelot, you know, that sort of thing. 
patterns from that would probably be, you know, more valuable than something that was off Broadway and, you know, closed in three weeks. Something, you know, I mean, if you got costumes from Cats, original patterns from Cats when it first opened back in the 70s in New York, I think that's when it was, those would have more value than a cat costume from now. So, but that's something that I would definitely want to look at because I think even if they didn't have a value based on the play or collectors, I think there are people who'd be very interested in them for what they are. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Yes. I, I definitely think uh, if you had something from cats or from something well known from the original production, it would be worth some money. And I see Carrie saying my thigh is bigger than their waist. <laughs> and Tammy's saying, God to have their waist. <laughs> I know it. And, and you know, this was for a size 14. So, you know, that dress did not look like that. No, it, it did not look like that. But we all can dream, right? <laughs> yes. If you don't have a mirror, then you look like that when you're wearing that dress. <laughs> That's right. This is an example of a different type of um, pattern paper. This one is actually a nice thick paper. I only have one that is like this, and it came in a um, pattern that it's called a sew, knit, and stretch pattern. It's 1968. And this would be something like, um, you know, the, the Lucy Show, very early Brady Bunch that Carol Brady would wear. It's not a yeah. very fancy graphic, but this is the type of paper you would want to get, this thicker paper, if you were going to transfer your pattern pieces onto something else to use them over and over, because this will last you a lot longer. And I like that price tag on that one. On um, this one, yeah, $1.50. I have some, like this one, I think is about my, my oldest pattern and it is 1953 and it's an example of what happens. I can't take it out of the plastic for you because if you look here, do you see how the edges have just broken apart? Yeah, every that is so I, unfortunate. Every time I touch it with my bare hand because it's so brittle, more little pieces fall off. So I've had to put it in this bag and this is where it's going to have to stay. But like I said, it's like 1953 and this is definitely, I love Lucy. This is what she was. Oh, it, it is. So I love Lucy. Which, and, and, I'm, and I'm so sad because I love this one as a graphic and I would like to frame it and use it, but it's just not usable. So it'll have to have a photocopy to be used. And Vinny's saying, man, look at those colors. Yeah, I have to say those colors are spectacular. And uh, Vintage Love and Nerd brings up a great point. She's saying, it makes me giggle that women used to dress for all the occasions, i.e. shopping and all kinds of things. I mean, even to get on the airplane, you would, you would dress in this kind of attire. I know. And while I don't want to have to go back to bullet bras and things like that, I do have to say that I, I miss the days of having coordinating shoes and handbags or, you know, not wearing your pajamas to the grocery store, maybe. <laughs> yes. Uh, there is something to be said for that. I, I think it's kind of nice how, you know, to get dressed to go places. And I think after this uh, pandemic, it's going to be interesting because everyone's used to being in their sweats all day. <laughs> yeah. There's, going to be a lot of pajamas at the grocery store <laughs> <laughs> yeah dressing to cook though i don't know about that one <laughs> I'm not well sure now they didn't dress like that to cook they wore a house dress which That's usually comes from the shoulders and it was your work dress you know and you didn't put that on until, you know, about 20 minutes before your husband got home. <laughs> That's true. You would dress again. I think I read uh, somewhere that they were saying there was a wording, but they, they in the 50s, there was this whole thing about getting dressed for your husband. So it would say to put on something that excites your husband, I think was the terminology. <laughs> dinner excites my husband. So I put dinner on. <laughs> <laughs> And Carrie's saying, next time you feel bored, try making a turkey dinner in high heels. <laughs> oh, not me. 
I'm past those days. I'm I'm in the grandma clothes days, and these are not grandma clothes. Well, you gotta just be wearing something comfy, I think. <laughs> exactly. All right. What? So, what's your next pattern, Martha? All right. One, well, like you saw with that 1968, I like to uh, collect wedding patterns. Because, one, I like wedding dresses. All little girls do. And I like what, looking how they change over the years. So let me just give you a little pictorial here of, of how things changed. So we saw this one, 1968. Okay. Well, now we're going to go to 1984. I know it's a big difference, but I don't have any 1970s weddings, wedding dresses. I'm, I'm lacking in that department. So by 1984, we were wearing these, these things with the flounces and the frills and <laughs> big shoulders, you know, big, yeah, a lot shoulders. of ruffles. Well, they were anticipating the nineties. So where is this one of my guess? Here we go. Sorry. I, you know what? I skipped one and I should have shown you this one because it was 1982. I think when you look at it, what does this wedding dress remind you of right here? Who do you think of when you see that dress? Oh, gosh, so many people. But I want to say there are several folks from TV I've seen in that outfit. I'm thinking of a royal wedding. Oh, yes, the Brits. Princess Diana. Mm-hmm. Her That dress just influenced people just for years to come. And this is very much like the dress that she wore. It's just gorgeous, I think. It is. It's much better than these ones from 1984. Yeah, with the poofy, with the big poofy shoulder caps. That's a little funky. Uh, no offense to anyone that wore that or liked that style, but it's not I, for me. I think there's a lot of wedding pictures and prom dresses out there that people don't want to show each other, anybody anymore. This and, one is. Uh, Christy is asking, Martha, do you sew often? Well, before I packed up my quilt, quilt room to move all my stuff around, I, I would sew just about every day. So now when this gets done, I'm going to have to pick a day of the week that I can do nothing but sew. And because I like to quilt. My mother-in-law is a, a quilter. She taught me to quilt. She's the head of our local quilt guild and she has a quilt shop. So we go over there and we all sit around and quilt and have lunch and, you know, do that sort of thing. Oh, how wonderful. I know it's a great way to connect with my mother-in-law, whom I love dearly. I love her to death. She is the she's the best. So then Martha, we went to uh, let's see, Christy saying, Martha, my mom is watching and says that wedding dress pattern looks like the wedding dress she made for her 1968 wedding. Does it have a train? This one or I think the Princess the one Diana one that you showed. This one? This yes, one does have a train, yes. That is beautiful. What a great story, Christy. So if you, let's see, 80, 86 went to this. And it's falling apart, so it's in a bag. These got a little wilder. And then we got into 1988. Uh, th this is a nightmare, but it looked so <laughs> funny. I had to, I had to get it. It's a wedding dress. Okay. I had to get it. Now is your it, favorite era, the fifties, or do you like some of these other ones just because they're so unique and different? No, my favorite era is the fifties, the sixties, then the seventies. Well, I like the forties too. Depends on what you're looking for. You know, if you're looking for wedding dresses, um, there's beautiful wedding dresses in the late forties into the early fifties, you know, so it's going to depend on the outfit, you know, really does. But then look at these from the nineties. Look at the bows on their backsides. That is a lot of fabric. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, the little tiny nothing veil, but those mermaid dresses and then the detachable trains. So I can't imagine trying to walk in those. I can't either. I didn't have a wedding dress like that. So I only have one men's pattern.
pattern, but it's a doozy. It's 1970. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that one. <laughs> I know. It looks like it's pajamas, but it's not. Look at that, top, that scarf around his neck. Oh, he Seems just, like something he could wear to the disco. <laughs> I, must be, you know. I mean, I, I, give me a man in blue jeans, not Argyle bell bottom. <laughs> It's a lot of patterns <laughs> to happen. Carrie's got a great question for you. She's asking, Martha, do you have any vintage Halloween costume patterns? You know, that's strange because I do not. Um, I probably, okay, now I will have some from the 80s from my kids. But I have not found any in the wild at the bins or the Goodwills or even at the antique malls. I think because they they don't get dated, people keep those. They don't get rid of them. You know, you can use a princess costume for 40 years. You can use a witch costume for 50 years, 60 years. As long as the pattern is still good, you can keep using it. That They don't really change. Whereas, you know, most people aren't making these for their little girls anymore. You know, you're not making these to wear out for dinner with your husband. So no, that's right. Patterns. Well, that's lucky for you in a way because you get all these great patterns. <laughs> yeah, they are. It is. You know, some of them, though, I, I pick up and they're just downright ugly. OK, they're just ugly, but I hate to let them just <laughs> be destroyed. OK, they're you got to face up to some of your shameful past and wearing some of these big, puffy, sleeved, ugly and culottes and things like that you know we wore them we've got to we got to own up to it well you're saving all the ugly vintage <laughs> keeping it from uh, the landfill which is such a great thing <laughs> and then, you know like i said it's a great time capsule of, of history to go back and see what people wore in different eras that's true and you know you can adapt patterns they don't have to be knee length culottes. You can make them shorter. You can turn them into shorts. You can change materials and it make things makes things look a lot more modern because a lot of the styles that people wear now are a throwback to what people wore 30, 40 years ago. But the different types of fabrics that we have now to choose from make them look more modern. The prints the fabric content, you know, nice stretchy leisure suit just is not the same as, you know, it's the, so the, the material content has a lot to do with it. Getting rid of the polyester helped a lot because that's hot in the summertime. Oh, it is hot. Oh boy. Is it. <laughs> it is. So let's see. All right, 1975. Mary Tyler Moore, um, the beginning of Charlie's Angels. We're looking at these kind of styles now. This had a very heavy prairie influence, and these were not designed for cooking in the kitchen generally, although you could have. These were day-to-day -day wear outfits to, to put over your skirts, to dress them up. Why? I don't remember, but we did it. We did it. <laughs> we did a lot of things, and I don't remember why. It reminds me a lot of Little House on the Prairie, that, that front uh, long dress. Right. And, you know, you could, you could use one of those. That's another thing. You can use one of these to make a costume for your kids for Halloween, for pl school plays. You know, like you're going to be the popular mom if they're doing a play that is a period vintage piece, you know, and you can provide some um, patterns that can be used to make authentic looking outfits for your theater group. Absolutely. And this one, <laughs> this one is 1971, <laughs> and you can see that we just, just totally departed from the mini skirts of the 60s the dresses down to your ankles the wide leg pants but they were they flowed more they gave you more freedom they were more airy um 
it's a more of a bohemian feel. Uh, I call it a California influence. It's your, it's y'all's fault, California, that we dress like that. <laughs> well, kidding. I think wide legs are coming back. I, I see wide leg jeans coming back now. Uh, hopefully they won't be here for very long because <laughs> wide leg jeans are not very flattering to most figures. So, and I found a, several of these that said Martha on them. Look at that. I did not write my name on these. <laughs> There was another Martha. You have a doppelganger somewhere. Obviously, they were somewhere, you know, back in 1971. She wrote her name on her name on here and said, someday another Martha will enjoy these. <laughs> well, that's very special that you found patterns with your name on them. How perfect. Yeah. Like I said, I have I have quite a few older ones or other ones that are that are packed away. I have like a 1930s <clears throat> lingerie, you know, a slip and the little camisole top outfit. But this is not that old, but I love this one. Vintage robes. Oh, wow. Look at the pattern on that. I, and it's the quilted type of material, you know, that you can get it. I already got that, that lining in it and everything. But they just, I, I love vintage robes. I remember getting them at Christmas <laughs> when I was a little girl. That's when we always got our new robes was at Christmas. You got house shoes and a robe at Christmas. So, yeah. And it's the only robe pattern that I have. But look at her hair. Look at those those braid pigtails. Now, that does look like Little House on the Prairie because Half Pint used to do that with her braids. Yeah. I love that they have pockets. Now, do you find that's pretty unusual? Or I, maybe for the robes, they're not. But for other things, you would think pockets are kind of rare. Not for the pockets. And house dresses always had pockets. I mean, not for pockets. Not for the robes. Robes tend to have pockets. House dresses tend to have pockets. It's really... Um, a lot of the ladies' dress, uh, outfits that they would shop in, you know, one-piece dress things would have them. Ladies had to have some place to put their handkerchief if they didn't have it right in their purse. So, and my grandma would always say, "You gotta have some place to put your Kleenex." So, <laughs> that sounds like a pocket. <laughs> something my grandmother would say. <laughs> and it's true. So. It is it's very true. And lots of people, Catherine's bringing up a great point that this is bringing back so many wonderful memories for people of their mothers sewing, their grandmothers sewing, making all kinds of dresses or costumes for different events. So that's so great. Well, I'm glad to hear that because like I said, I, I started, my mother started teaching me how to hand sew when I was younger than eight. And I know that by the time my father passed away, when I was eight, I was sewing on her big Singer sewing machine, making doll clothes. And my mom made our Barbie clothes all the time. She made us the most beautiful Barbie clothes. She would go to the fabric store and buy remnants, little pieces, because you didn't need big pieces for Barbie clothes. You just needed little ones. So, uh, and that sewing machine had a smell that I'll never forget when it ran. It was the the singer oil you know that you'd have to oil your machine with so when it would run it would make this this warm smell that i can still remember today that is a comforting smell to me i just can't duplicate it anywhere <laughs> that's so wonderful you know all of those smells and textile things really bring back a lot of memories for us and that some of those uh smells from when we were younger just bring us so much comfort they do they do so, and, and sewing notions, I, I, I tend to gravitate to picking up sewing machine attachments that won't even fit my sewing machines because they're in a nice box. I've got a good sewing graphic. Or, and I have scissors. <laughs> I have so <laughs> many scissors just because I find them. And I'm like, oh, I can, you know, because when you were, I need some pinking shears, though. I do not have any pinking shears. And I'm ashamed of myself because... You need pinking shears. I can help you out with that. I I have my uh, great grandmother's 1916 Singer sewing machine behind me. I don't know if that's going to show up on camera, but well, 
there it is. I don't know if you can see that, but I opened the drawer. I was going through it and I was like, holy moly, there must be at least 13 pairs of various scissors in there, including pinking shears and small little seam rippers and other types of sewing things. It's just like a time capsule from uh, when she, she last used it. I know. And it's like, you, you don't want to do anything. You want to leave it just like it was. Cause mm -hmm. that, you know, she, she just got up and left the room. If you don't mess yep. with it, she could be coming back to take up sewing again. So I get it. I totally get it. And uh, LJ is saying, do you have a singer featherweight sewing machine? Love that little machine. Me? I think they're asking you because you were saying you have the, the singer machine. Is it a featherweight? Oh, I, I don't think so. Uh, mine does have a cabinet. Let me see if I can uh, just. Me personally, I do not. I know lots of people that do have them and they scare me to look at them, to think about trying to sew on them because they, they look like you've got to be a really good sewist to, to use a featherweight. Although I hear people say all the time that they're one of the best machines you'll ever use to sew on. But I haven't had the opportunity to purchase one. I, I have several machines, modern machines. I have a, a beautiful green one from the 1960s. Um, sewing machine. I had a Davis sewing machine that I sold because it was just really too old. I, so I, I like the ones that come in cabinets. So I have like three of them that are in cabinets that pop up. So I think you are, um, you have muted yourself. There you go. Oh, I muted myself. Whoops. Yeah. Okay, folks, so I'm moving back. Your phone. Uh, I was going to ask you, do you still have your uh, mother's sewing machine? No, my sister got that because she was older than I was. So it got passed to her, you know. Oh, well, I'm glad it's still in the family. <laughs> yes. When there's more than one girl, you got to divide things up. I don't, I didn't get her patterns, her clothing patterns. I got the Barbie doll patterns. And so I'm, I'm assuming my sister got the clothing patterns, but at that time, the Barbie doll patterns were more important to me anyway, because they what they represented with her using them and, and making things. So and then I took them and I made clothing for my daughter, for my daughters for Christmases and birthdays. And their friends were always jealous because they didn't have they had different Barbie clothes than everybody else. You know, homemade ones don't, don't look like store ones. They're different styles and colors and materials and they're better. <laughs> I would say that they're better. They're, they're definitely more fun and unique and extra mm -hmm. special. Yeah. Well, Martha, so, thank you so much for coming on tonight and showing your patterns. Just so much eye candy there. And uh, I really loved Mel's comment. He was talking about how much he loves this uh, show and tell series because he's always learning about a new different topic. And that's really my hope with these is that you guys will be inspired to either start your own collection of vintage patterns or any of the other great show and tells I'll have, or just learn a little something about a new area of vintage that you hadn't thought about before. I agree. I, I know I've been enjoying them. And if anybody has, um, um, if there's any questions that they think of later on, I have a video that will drop after this, this episode that covers the patterns um, where I speak about them a little bit more. So maybe their question might be answered in that if they want to drop by my channel and, and look it up. Absolutely. So guys, go subscribe to Martha at Vintage Conversation. That video is going to be absolutely wonderful. I know I can't wait to watch it. And it's always so much fun having special guests on. So uh, next week, I'm going to have Vintage Vinny, Vintage Vinny with his pinup collection. So I'm very excited about that. He will be my guest for next week. So stay tuned for that on Show and Tell. And uh, I have a fun video coming tomorrow, so stay tuned at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I will be live from Eco Relics, so I'll be doing a live shop along, so stay tuned for that. And again, thank you so much, Martha. You had some fantastic patterns to show. I really loved having you on. Thank you, Katie. I appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to come and share my, my little collection with you guys, and I had a lot of fun. Thanks. 
and sure was. So guys, go subscribe to Martha, follow her on Instagram, and of course on YouTube. And uh, thank you all so much for joining us. It was a lot of fun. And again, if you have any questions like Martha said, or you have patterns that you want to share with Martha, make sure to send her an email. Her email is on the screen here at a vintage conversation at gmail.com. All righty, folks, that's it for us. Thank you so much. And I hope as always, you will stay in, stay safe, and then YouTube. Bye-bye now. Bye.